Dias and blessings to be in this place and go on these separate ways. Help us that we may always keep in our hands. And thank you for everything that you've done. In your name we pray. Amen.
Pastor Pat Morrison is a chaplain at Andrews University. Pastor Mo, as the students call him, was a speaker for our week of prayer in April. His energetic spirit and his cheerful attitude made him a fast friend. He likes people, stars, and family. We are delighted to bring you Pastor Pat Morrison.
that in the height of this depression in 1893, Seventh-day Adventist schools were starting to blossom into existence big time, right in the midst of this financial crisis. At this same time, skyscrapers and apartment buildings were going up like crazy during an economic mess. Mount Vernon Academy, which was referred to as that Ohio school, was partially spawned due to the explosive growth of Battle Creek College at that same time. All in the midst of a financial crunch. Battle Creek, in college, Battle Creek College was enjoying a distinguishable revival. It is also noted that finally, Bible class was becoming a regular one of the course offerings. It was not part of early Seventh day Adventist education. Of course, they met together for worships and chapels, but it wasn't an established part of the curriculum in the Seventh day Adventist schools at their inception. At the time of MBA's beginnings, BCC boasted 768 students, and E.G. White suggested that rather than to expand in Battle Creek, there should be a school established in Ohio to give character to the work. Now, folks, I think that part came true. There's a bunch of character up here right now. There's quite a bit down there. Character to the work worked. So began the saga of Mount Vernon Academy. W.T. Bland was the first principal. Don't you love that name? Graduation must have been really exciting. Bland. He was in his early 30s at the time. Yeah. You have the strength to be a principal when you're in your early 30s. Right? He must have been quite a rising star because it was just a few, a few years later he was president of Union College. Just a little later he became treasurer of the General Conference, which is significant in that he was very involved in the move of the General Conference from Battle Creek to the D.C. area, and not much later he was instrumental in the 1914 establishment of Washington Missionary College. This is significant because Mount Vernon College, which this institution had become granting full Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Arts degrees, Mount Vernon College became Mount Vernon Academy again since Washington Missionary College became the Columbia Union Conference College. And the person who started out here as principal would have been involved in that transition. In 1920, if you look at the annual from back then, it was editorialized that the college status should be returned since the facilities and the faculty were of such stature. So, when you look at what this school has come through, survived is not bad terminology. Prevailing through the spirit is not a bad explanation of even your past, though you use it for your future. Just a bit more of this historical stuff I'll borrow from the history of one of your big sister institutions. At Union, as late as 1904, the matron and the business manager were still charged with collecting revolvers and other concealed weapons from incoming students. Doesn't sound real familiar, does it? Meals were very formal occasions and opportunities for principal and faculty to teach some table etiquette. The principal would be at the meal and he would give them instructions. And and then meals became a place where at each table the, the seating was very much arranged and there was a host and hostess for each table. And they were served family style and some of the, the host would have to go back into the kitchen, get the bowls of food, and then they would serve the people at the table. Of course, everyone was seated appropriately and, and gentlemen rose when ladies came in the room. All that old stuff, which I'd still like to live by, but you know, you can get hurt open the door for some people. <laughs> Students were addressed as Miss or Mr. Students lived in homes, not dormitories. Now, it was the same building, it's just you called it a home. That was supposed to change the atmosphere in that place. I've stayed in the women's home here each time I've been here. I think it's a dormitory. <laughs> I wish I could verify how widespread the next one was, because you guys especially, We'll have a hard time 
with this, when at Union at least the students were fed two meals a day, that's not too bad till you realize that the second meal came at 1.30 in the afternoon. And you were supposed to somehow survive from 1.30 until the next morning. Can you imagine it? And the eating between meals was a punishable offense. So students became quite creative. In one case, now this didn't happen in Hunter, I don't think. In one case, since there was a ledge between the guys' rooms, two groups of fellows stewed a chicken after 1.30. The dean smelled it, but when he went to the room to check, the fellows in the next pulled on the rope tied to the handle and pulled it to their window. When he tried to follow it then to the next room, of course, the fellows just pulled it back the other way. So they had a stewed chicken on a seesaw. Vegetarianism was not the routine in the earliest days of Seventh Avenue schools, though the Union embraced it by 1897. I don't know when it hit Auburn. It's hard for you to even imagine what it took on the part of others for you to have what you had here. You have Deuteronomy 6 uses some applicable language in referring to the Israelites inhabiting the land which the Lord had provided. It talks about houses filled with all kinds of good things that you didn't provide. That's what you found when you got here. A lot of good things that you really didn't have much to do with. And you did something with it later. It talks about drinking from wells that you didn't dig. We take that for granted in our society. Vineyards and olive groves that you didn't plant. And then it says, be careful that you do not forget the Lord. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight. You've profited from what has gone before here. And my question to you is, what have you left? When you passed that torch last evening, what was in it? What did you leave for these? How was the school left improved because you were here? And if you can't think of something really good, the Alumni Association will talk to you and you can figure something out. Let's look at some of the questions that are basic to your saying. What have you personally, individually survived? What have you been through? What has tested you besides your studies because of your stay here that you knew the term survived? It would be an experience common to many if you were to say you came here doing your best to do the right things in order to satisfy parental or authority expectations. That would be a real common thing for a person to come here as a freshman or even a sophomore and be doing the right stuff for the reason of making someone else happy. But now, You've developed your own set of values, your own set of personal expectations, and your concern for your own personal integrity. That's the basis of your decisions now. Your religion is now your own and growing and isn't practiced just because your parents expect it. Now, this isn't the case with you. It's time to come. Time to take another look at it. What has your school survived at your expense? That's another question. What have your faculty grown with you through? Are there any squeaks that they've helped you to oil? Survival is such a little word. It carries a lot of baggage today. I know it's caused some consternation on the part of some of you that you use it in your sayings. There are survivalist magazines that uh, give grown men opportunities to play at war. There are legitimate survivors of disasters and famines. And there are survivors, folk who have faced tremendous odds in life and have 
continue to not just survive, but to really actually enjoy a significant quality to their lives. The qualifier in your saying, by the grace of God, makes you want to ask, what has God kept you for? Why have you survived? Why has he aided you this far in your educational experience? What's the purpose? Why has God bent his power and wisdom and protection toward you? So you can arrive at this proud day? That's part of it. But there's much more. Through his spirit, we shall prevail. Another movement of his grace is the gift of the Spirit for daily survival. That's a part of it, but, but much more. Prevail is a big word. It's another loaded term with at least a note of perseverance involved in it, that, uh, of overcoming that's inherent in the use of the term. Prevail means that. It also indicates something out of the routine. Prevail denotes a challenge to be scaled, a challenge to be conquered. That's in your saying. So what is it you prevail over with the power of the universe at your behest? Will you climb some huge educational mountain to be the foremost, what, teacher? Surgeon? Will you challenge your own sense of personal security or safety to reach out and help a third world people that don't even know that you have help for them? That would be prevailing. To set out as an official missionary of the church or as a tent maker missionary that goes out in an occupation and through that occupation helps people in another part of the world. Will you follow a lifelong dream in your career that's automatically? No, not automatically. Another career, not automatically thought of as a helping occupation. And from that platform, introduce a whole new set of people to the realities of Christianity. Will you settle? This is for the ladies. Will you settle into the often characterized as mundane life as a housewife to manage a home that produces children worthy of the name Christian disciple?
Now, having made great choices and getting that basket full of just the right gems, what do you do with the rest of your life? You have all the resources you'll ever need, but prevailing will require some very careful choices in tune with your benefactor. I, the grace of God. In fact, he's assured you all the resources you need. So to put quality into your life, you have to make some choices and the most important ones, of course, is who will be your advisor, who will walk through this life. I don't know whether to introduce this as a story. I didn't read it in the newspaper, it came from the story file, so maybe we better call it a parable. He had never given up hope, but it would, would have been reasonable to give up hope. They were in a European country torn in shreds in World War II. In fact, they were one of the many families that was separated because when their town was invaded, they weren't in the same place and they just had to head for the hills and they didn't head the same direction and there was no way to discover where the other had gone. He shows up in the picture as the kindly old church custodian, someplace here in the U.S. of A, working for just enough to supplement his pension. His love for his wife had never waned, though he had no reason to even hope that he would ever see her again, still alive. But he couldn't divorce her from his mind, and he was never even slightly tempted to marry again. He held on to a shred of hope and longed to see her and loved her dearly. Today, he went on with his life in hope. One day, in his rounds through the church, he was struck by the starkness of the opening for the baptistry. He'd seen it many times, but for some reason, today when he looked at it, he says, that's ugly. And he encountered the pastor with the suggestion that somehow a, a curtain should be put up there. And the pastor, who had gotten used to what was there as well, he, he'd seen that same opening many times, and probably when he first saw it, he thought, ugly. he got used to it. But when the custodian comes and brings it to his attention, he says, well, sure enough, Right. I'm going to see what I can do. He acknowledged the need, promised to look for something, and sometime later he found himself in a second-hand shop. He thought he'd do something temporary because he didn't really feel like he had the ability to do it good, but he knew he was satisfied that he was going to be something. So he went to his shop and he explained his need to the proprietor. And having explained his need, he was shown a beautiful hand crochet tablecloth. Just the right size. Whoa. I'll see what John thinks of this. So he took it back with him. And he pinned it up. Now he obviously didn't set it up like it was going to be set up, but he pinned it up there. And when John saw it, when old John walked into that church, he literally gasped. Where does this come from? The pastor had never seen old John this assertive before. Where did this come from? And the pastor didn't know how to read his reaction. Where did this come from? And when the pastor explained, John begged to be taken to the shop. The pastor was really struggling to understand. Now, your way of heaven. John recognized the table that had graced their table on special occasions many, many, many years before. And he knew the work, painstaking work, wife had gone to the crochet that tablecloth. And so he was reunited with his wife after decades apart. The rest of the story is that she was so destitute that she'd become so bad off that she had come to her last resort. Her last tie to her husband John was that tablecloth that they'd used on those special occasions. And she'd become so destitute that she'd taken it to the second hand shop sell it so that she could survive just a little longer. They had lived just a few miles apart in this adopted country. And for both and her apparent bad luck had instead been the final stroke of providence that reunited them. They had much more than survived. They had indeed prevailed. 
you have an eternal future ahead of you. But don't look too far into the future. Today is your commencement. Commencement means beginning. Today is your commencement, another opportunity to begin. Don't let it pass. Survival is okay. But now in God's spirit, prevail and lay claim to this part of your eternal future. Reach out and grab what he's promised you already. And then live when you have it. Congratulations to Mount Vernon Academy. And to you, class of 1993, on this milestone in your personal and in this institutional journey.
representative from Club Union College here. We came on the platform. We didn't see any representative from Kettering here. But if they are here uh, at this time, they will come forward. It's an opportunity for our students to receive some awards from the Seventh day Adventist Colleges and our union and our conference here. And there are other awards that students have received, but these are the ones that are being presented at this particular time. We have with us representing Columbia Union College, the uh, financial administrator for the college, Mr. Jim Green, and he will present the awards for Columbia Union College. On behalf of Columbia Union College, I would like to thank the administration of Mount Vernon Academy for inviting CUC to be present to share in the joy of seniors of your special day. Especially on this, the 100th anniversary, you have a special honor to be the class who will always be remembered as the winner. In today's world, a college education is very important. And an education in the Seventh-day Adventist Christian institution is almost mandatory for those who are sincere about their faith. We would encourage you to continue your education at an Adventist institution like CUC, as your membership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is important to all of us. I am happy to announce that Columbia Union College, under the leadership of our new president, Dr. Charles Strickland, has adopted a motto of making CUC a Christocentric college. We would invite you to further your education at CUC. And today we would like to honor those of you for the achievements which you have accomplished during your 12 years of study to this point in time. The first one goes to Melina Arujo, a $1,000 academic scholarship.
academic $1,000 and for the President's Roundtable $2,000. Advanced 
diploma, Krista Marie Kirschbaum.
moving of their tassel from one side to the other, and she will lead them in this symbolic act at this time.
Oh my god, you guys got to do a little more. Finally, Kevin gets to see my room, but it's all man. Because I'm back in there. He said it's a because he started raining. No, it wasn't raining. No, it's not the rain. I washed them. And I, I went to put them in the dryer. And they kept not just running away.
Mother, our picture. It's hard to understand why why this one's so dark. Can you this picture? How do you do now? I can't see. I can't see. You know what this is right here. So there's one. Look at this. Well, can we see me? I think so. Oh, come here. Oh, you just come here. Oh, yeah, just get over here. It does fit. Uh -huh. Just get over here. Oh, just go over here and come see me. Oh, just want to come see me. Oh, just want to come see me. Oh, just get you. What'd you do to that doll's hair? Right. You just come over here and see me, boy. Oh, didn't call your TV. Oh, that's why it's TV. Who? Honey, I'm not sure how you do it, to be totally honest. Boys have got ones that talk in their toy box. I can't. 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 Push her belly. It says, rub my hair on your best friend. And last, big Danny says, I'm going to wear it. Fine, fine. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. No, no, it doesn't, honey. No, it doesn't have What is